Um, what I'm going to talk about today is something before what we would consider the beginning of life, which is uh, pre-partum. I am not getting into any political discussions or theological discussions on this subject at all. Uh, we all have attitudes about it, but there's enough going on uh, in utero for us to be able to learn something postpartum and then probably into life. Uh, my field actually is developmental neuroscience. And so I look at the aging process as well as the developmental process and looking for comparisons between the two. So let's go through the history of this stuff pretty quickly and tell you what my problems are with the history since Broca. First of all, uh, in terms of what I'm after um, today, uh, we need to kind of disappear the issue of localization of function. That is, if you remember um, way back when that the temporal lobes have something to do with um, audition and Wernicke's area with the understanding of language and Broca's area has something to do with expressive language and the frontal lobes with executive function. And that's a very nice process and it actually does work in adults, but it's a non-starter for us to be actually able to understand how the nervous system works. So um, there was this gentleman named Broca who had uh, more time on his hands than uh, he should have. And as a result, he spent time uh, putting numbers on various regions of the brain, like areas eight and nine uh, fields of adversion, 18 and 19, have something to do with where you look voluntarily or not. Very, very nice, except if you're a neurosurgeon, it's not going to work for you because you're going to need to keep the patient under local anesthetic so that you know where you are. So thank you very much, Broca, but this isn't a model that's effective for us. So let me give you a clinical case. On the left, you see a normal CT, and on the right, is the CT with obvious hydrocephalus, um, uh, in large ventricles rather, in um, Terry, the case of Terry Chiavo. Terry Chiavo was a lady who, uh, as a result of anoxia during delivery, uh, wound up in a persistent vegetative state for 11 or 12 years. And this case was actually decided in the US Supreme Court, and no vote about the US Supreme Court either. Um, in which case her family being Catholic wanted her to remain on life support and her husband wanted the feeding, feeding tubes pulled. Supreme Court decided to allow the uh, husband's uh, case of pulling the feeding tube. She died about a week later. Interesting, but not fundamentally interesting. Here's another case of, um, in this case, a hydrocephalic uh, from birth individual who was actually a student at the University of Manchester in the school in England, in the School of Architecture. And here, she's congenitally hydrocephalic. She was 18 years old at the time this was taken, and she had a full-scale score of 118. So we have, starting with an interesting problem, which is on the left-hand case, we have enlarged ventricles, seriously enlarged large ventricles, and a persistent vegetative state. And sorry for the compressed speech, but I want to get this all together in the space of time that I have allotted to me. In the case on the right, what we have is a young lady who was born in this condition, the gray matter appears uh, around the, uh, what should be various parts of the uh, neocortex. Um, and this is she at birth, hydrocephalic. She was, did receive a shunt and that did take care of the problem. And uh, this is her um, CT. And here is the regional cerebral blood flow image as she was performing mental arithmetic while she was 18 years old. And you can see that the distribution of activity is significantly different than what it is in most of our heads. I'm assuming that nobody here today is actually hydrocephalic from birth. Which brings us to a number of different problems. That is, we know that from birth, and in fact before birth, there is the organization, um, histological organization of neurons uh, so that the dotted line here represents the higher cortical function, higher cognitive function that's developing over time as a consequence of age. The dashed lines refer to receptive language, which has a different time course, and sensory function has yet a different time course than the other two. Very nice. That's the model we typically have, but no one's busy asking the questions, what happens during fetal development? So here we have, let's start with the neonate. Here we have a paucity of connectivities between neurons in the case of the newborn. We have an increase in the number of neurons as a consequence of the aging process itself, nine months of increase, two years. And the adult model, compared to the two, or actually the eight-year-old model, in fact, I can show you a better slide in a moment, is this. These are histologies of a five-day-year-old infant, a six-year-old child, 
and an adult. So the adult is actually closer to the five-day-old infant than it is to the young child, school-aged child. And there's a reason for it. The reason that there's an over-connectivity or potential connectivities in a school-aged child is because the kid is beginning to learn associations. Things are becoming automatic. And the point is to automate as much as possible because the energy demands of the brain are so, of the brain are so are significant. 20% uh, of uh, glucose, glucose metabolism in the body is dedicated to brain function. So you want to try to optimize that as much as possible. And that's why we have localization of function. But it's not because that's the end goal. That just makes life easier. And that's also the reason why someone can suffer a broca's aphasia after a stroke, for example, and six months later, this guy's talking. Because if it was the way the neuropsychologist had said it was for the past 150 years and they're beginning to change their mind, then anyone in the rehabilitation business ought to go home. Because what we're essentially saying is nothing can be rehabilitated. No, there's a significant degree of plasticity in the nervous system, and that's what we're trying to play with. So here's an example of um, exactly what we've been talking about, and let's move on to the next issue. So developmentally, there are critical periods, sensitive periods for early brain development. So we have um, a particular curve for um, habitual ways of responding. Bear in mind the issue of habituation, because we'll talk about it in a moment. A moment. Emotional control, of course, develops over the first two years of life, which is when our children at the age of two fun, finally discover the word no. And so they say, don't put your, mommy says, don't put your foot in the street because you may get run over. The kid turns his head and um, tries it. In other words, he's, he's playing with things because he's beginning to discover that he actually has control over the, um, the frontal uh, prefrontal limbic system circuits and also via the temporal lobes as well. We have the same thing for vision and hearing, peer and social skill. And the implication is that birth is the beginning of all of this thing and it couldn't be more incorrect. So let's take a look at the whole process uh, in case you don't remember, or for those of you who've never seen it, let's take a look at the process of neural development from conception. Um, and this is up until the, the birth process. So um, we have a neural plate that forms in the outermost layer of embryonic cells. And the neural plate folds to form a neural groove and then curls to form the neural tube. And uh, the tube differentiates into the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain, and then penultimate, uh, within this, uh, the spinal cord itself, as you can see in this particular animation. And the forebrain will develop into the neocortex, which will be largely responsible for transmitting, translating sensory information, i.e. perception. It all con also controls complex behaviors, thoughts, memory, problem solving. The midbrain uh, will also develop, uh, and that will send information from the body to various sites. It inter it's an integrative uh, issue. And the hindbrain penultimately will be controlling autonomic function, the spinal cord, and that spinal cord pathway will convey information to the rest of the body, i.e. between the brain and the rest of the body. Somewhere between four and eight weeks gestational age, the embryo grows rapidly and the face becomes recognizably human. The eyes move to the side, the head begins to emerge, looks like a normal human being. And we have the development of the cerebral hemispheres, non-convoluted. Sometime between eight and 26 weeks of, of uh, the fetal uh, life, this, the neocortex grows, will cover the midbrain, 28 weeks, there's a major structural surface area and that becomes convoluted, wrinkled, folded inside, and is beginning to look like the adult human brain. Sometime between 28 and uh, the 40th week, uh, the surface fills with uh, the sulci and gyri, and um, that is essentially neonatal development. So here's an overall picture of the old thing. What does it mean for us practically? So, there are patterns of brain growth. Uh, and if we take a look at pre-birth, we can see that the prefrontal cortex, which is associated with reasoning and self-regulation, is actually developing. Uh, we can also see that the visual cortex is doing something similar also prior to birth. And um, also the auditory cortex is doing so, is similar, is similar as well. So the question is, 
is the fetus conscious or not? And that's a non-starter question. The reason it is because I don't know what consciousness is. Philosophers define it one way. We in medicine define it in yet another way. So for example, we define it as being awake and aware, but there's all kinds of things in between. So what we need to do is to really pull this argument apart and see what we can do. So we know that consciousness is difficult to measure and it's not just simply a consequence of EEG state. Consciousness is also a hypothetical construct and it's a concept that's used to describe something that we believe exists, but we cannot be directly observed or measured. For example, if we have go through an operative procedure like a colonoscopy procedure, like colonoscopy, and we have diazepam as a vehicle to keep us under, it's very different than being intubated and having general anesthesia where you actually, for all intents and purposes, are cognitively dead. There is nothing that you remember, those of you who, those of us, who've been through um, surgical procedures of one sort or another, know what that's about. So psychologists tend to infer what they know about an individual state of consciousness from the information that's provided to them. Like, were you aware? Did you remember any of this? Um, we have dreams during, so I can ask questions about it. But if I have a patient who, uh, who is out, well, I'm going to infer that they were unconscious at a particular point in time, but I don't know that for sure. So I'm going after physiological changes. So what we do know about the conscious state is that we have an ability to be aware of ourselves and our surroundings. And you know, of course, the penultimate question here is the fetus in that state or not? We have the ability to know of our own existence and the existence of objects and events inside and outside the organism. But does that mean that an autistic person who doesn't is unconscious? No, of course he's, he or she is conscious. Um, we can say with consciousness, we have a momentary creation of mental knowledge that describes the relation between the organism and object and an event. And we're gonna hang our hats on this particular aspect of consciousness right now. And the, second, the other matter that's important for our uh, further discussion today is um, that what we're trying to do is to have an integration of neural activity that's in a way similar to the binding of different aspects of sensation and perception that occurs in order for us to have a unified perception of the world. So for example, what's underneath this is the issue of functional connectivity. So you can have neurons, and if they don't work together, they're not going to do you anything. You're not going to be conscious. But are you going to be alive? Probably, maybe. So for example, I can get a piece of entrecote, a delicious steak at the butcher shop, and put that uncooked steak under a microscope and the cells will still be mitotically dividing. So is the cow alive? Of course not. But is the piece of meat alive? Yeah, but is it conscious? Obviously not. So we're gonna to need to build something for us to understand what we're talking about, to provide a vehicle so that we can see, is learning possible prepartum? How does it affect what happens to the neonate? And what happens to the neonate, does that impact on child development actually through the entire development process, developmental process into uh, the advanced years? So the medical model is the easiest for us to use. And here what we have essentially is we're defining consciousness or conscious awareness as a continuum, a bounded continuum between brain dead and something at the top of the scale, let's call it an epileptic seizure, if you will. And somewhere in between, we're either comatose, we're vegetative, minimally conscious or normal. And there's a wide range of what normal actually is. But underneath that is the issue of not awake, not aware, you're comatose. Awake, but not aware, you're in a vegetative state. And if it's for over a year, it's persistent. If you're awake and aware, but not particularly aware of your surroundings, not particularly or not particularly awake, we call that minimally conscious. And we're playing with this all the time because after you finish with a um, long day at work and the butler comes with your smoking jacket and the dog is there with your newspaper and you're sitting in front of a fireplace, your state of attention is going to be very different than when you're solving a mathematical problem. So there's variation in all of this and we need to understand that in order for us to look at fetal development. What we can say about fetal development on the basis of what we discussed up to this point is that we're dealing with a diffuse and organized neuronal system in the brain stem diencephalon and the cerebral hemispheres. And on the basis of the video that I showed you previously, obviously the development of the neocortex and the cerebral hemispheres is uh, critically important for our understanding of, of these issues. 
So, um, the consciousness system consists of portions of the brain stem and the reticular formation. Uh, these are neurochemically well-defined nuclear groups in the brain stem, the thalamic nuclei, the basal forebrain, the ascent, forebrain, the ascending projections to the thalamus and cortex, and finally, the widespread areas of the cortex that need to be functionally connected. Um, and when they're not functionally connected, you're still alive, you may still be conscious, but you are certainly not functioning at any optimum level whatsoever. It would be like our former now dead prime minister who uh, stroked out a number of times, was able to recognize his uh, son's voices, but uh, was in all other respects not capable of functioning. And that's because of the disconnection between different portions of the brain. So big question here, is the fetus aware of this or if the fetus not? So this brings us to the issue of the fetus itself. There is now 30 years of research that tell us that preterm infants and fetuses perceive, they learn, and they work in order to regulate themselves, their environment, and their experiences. They are in control, in other words, of their own environment. The environment is, pro is provided to them, but what's going on in their environment has a certain degree of independence. So preterm infants, for example, those are um, infants, neonates, that are born prematurely, but they're no longer in utero, typically favor experiences that are development, developmentally supportive and actively avoid experiences that are developmentally disruptive. So they're already capable of making distinctions between um, things that work for them and things that don't. Uh, well, there was the British uh, Commission for Inquiry into Fetal Sentience, and you know why such a thing existed. And that they agreed with what I've said to this point, which is that consciousness is associated with shifting brain patterns, uh, but that we don't particularly well, un well understand how this works. But the issue of functional connectivity is important. And while we may not have unequivocal evidence for fetal consciousness because we can't achieve that for adults, there's some things that we can surmise. So the summary here is that the fetuses may well be conscious from six weeks uh, of gestation onwards. So going back to our original medical model, the question is, is the fetus conscious, ever conscious or aware? And what we do know is that consciousness occurs when all incoming information from external and internal environments are available to all parts of the cortex simultaneously. In other words, when you have a gait problem as an adult, because of normal, as a normal consequence of aging, it's not the motor system that's impaired. It's proprioception that is becoming impaired, which has an effect on the vestibular system, which has an effect on the auditory meatus, which has an effect on the visual system. So to be careful, what you typically do is you start sliding your feet. So normal aged gait is um, a consequence of the breakdown of these functional connectivities. And so by any standard, the fetus is not at the same neurological level as a neonate or an infant. But it doesn't mean that it's not at any functional, co co functioning cognitive level, just the opposite, actually. Um, they do sleep. And um, it is possible, as we know, to be awake and not conscious in sleep. So let's get to see what we can do about um, getting into specifics. From about 20 gestational weeks or so onwards, the fetus responds to light, sound, taste, touch, with increasingly complex movements. So the assumption here is when the fetus moves, it's moving in response to something, or may just be doing it. Um, but if it repeats that movement again and again, each time you stimulate it, then you're getting a stimulus response connection. So the next question is, if cortical activity is used by us to measure consciousness, uh, then the EEG demonstrates that sometime between 19 and 20 weeks, we actually have EG, EEG patterns that are consistent with stimulus response. Uh, somatosensory evoked potentials, for example, that is a computer average transient potential uh, associated with repetitive stimulation can be recorded, sensory stimulation can be recorded from about 24 weeks onwards. And that we know also that fetuses acquire distinct verbal memories from their prenatal experiences from pretty much the third trimester onwards, which continues to support the idea that consciousness develops before delivery. And we can look at the well-being of the fetus 
cognitively or otherwise, by looking at these movement patterns, looking at the sleep states, looking at behavioral arousal, looking at um, fetal oxygen and CO2 uh, status, uh, looking at endocrine status, especially progesterone and estrogen, estrogen status, uh, and, ta and the effect of tactile stimulation as well. And these variables are relatively easy to measure, including heart rate and respiratory effort, reflex irritability, muscle tone, and whether the, uh, ne whether the fetus is cyanotic or not. Um, but practically, in terms, practically speaking, in terms of cognitive function, the fetus can differentiate between familiar and novel stimuli, but somewhere time between the 32, 32nd and 33rd gestational week. They can remember prenatal stimuli and react accordingly. And very active fetuses tend to be very active children who might even be a labeled hyperactive later on. So we even have a movement marker that may well be associated with cognitive and actual behavioral issues postpartum. Um, we also know that the fetus can differentiate between familiar and novel stimuli sometime between the 32nd and 33rd gestational week and they can remember prenatal stimuli and react accordingly, as we said, and very active fetuses are very active children later on. And this is a graph of development pretty much, uh, which includes fetal behavior. Uh, as a consequence of gestational age, we have the weight here. Um, we have twitches, moves, uh, heads, breathing movements, opens, jaws, sucks, swallows, nothing particularly great. But we are beginning to get pain reactions by about the 20, before the 25th week. Uh, we do have cry expressions. We have reactions, reactivity to sound. Habituation was an aspect, which is an aspect of learning, visual fixation, and it does go on to actually include imitation and babbling, which they must have learned someplace before they were born. Let's look at that. Let's start with the issue of fetal movement. We see a heartbeat, three weeks. Head, arms, legs, six to 10 gestational weeks. Hand to head, face and mouth, movement and swallowing, 10 weeks. Reactive movement to the environment, like mommy coughs or there's laughter, we react, 10 to 15th week. And a full repertoire of movements that we can biomechanically model, and we've done it, starts at around 14 weeks of age. Uh, because this is being recorded, you guys will be able to see these slides later on. They will be available. And here is uh, a list of uh, starting from lateral head movements, which we can see in planaria also, by the way, a flatworm. Uh, but here it starts at seven weeks for the human and suck and swallow when yawning 11 to 12 weeks. So let's take a look at yawning. Here we have a lovely 4D um, ultrasound-based image of yawning, but that's not necessarily in response to anything. But this is. So here we can see the movements, and it can be a sense that we still haven't determined whether this is, a sense, whether this is associated with sensory stimulation yet. But let's take a look at this further. <laughs> Twins, obviously. We have hugging behavior. We do respond to touch. We get the point. So let's move this ahead. Uh, we can actually record the biomechanics and we've done it and also the EEG in associated with these biomechanical movements and find that they are in fact responsive, these movements are peculiar and responsive to a particular kind of stimulation. Um, so the question is, is this movement myogenic or is there something else going on? Is it neurogenic? Is it generated by the brain or is it just a question of muscle twitch? Like, pardon me, but as physiotherapists would have us believe, um, it's not, it's for sure neurogenic, but let's take a look at why. We know that movement is necessary for normal anatomic and physiological development. In fact, if we have any kind of motor impairment and you don't move and you don't think about moving, there will be degen a neural degeneration, atrophic changes in the musculature, 
In fact, I have a little anecdote. Uh, it was a lecture I gave at Oxford about four or five, maybe even six years ago, where I was talking about my research, which is the relationship between movement and cognition. And um, I had said, probably stupidly, about 50 minutes into the lecture, that if you don't move, you get stupid. And there was a um, gentleman sitting in a wheelchair in the audience, and I didn't recognize him. And uh, then I did. Uh, it was the late Stephen Hawking. And that was profoundly embarrassing. And I jumped off the podium right after the lecture, and I excused and apologized to myself. And he said, there's nothing to apologize for. Um, because in fact, he played tennis every day for about an hour, hour and a half. And the learning point of that is that the uh, thinking of movement, which relates to a previous speaker's comment, uh, the anticipation of movement, the uh, imagining of movement is as effective as movement itself because the brain is actually inactive when we move, but it's completely, inact it's completely active when the movement is being planned. And that's the reason why the motor strip is located in the frontal lobes. So uh, movement is necessary for anatomic and physiological development. It serves adaptive functions uh, behaviorally, and it serves as practice for the fetus for future behavior. It's practicing its future behaviors, but it is not an epi epiphenomenon. So let's take a look at fetal sensation, perception, and the capacity to learn in utero. Does the fetus learn? And the answer is here is a traditional habituation graph. At 32 weeks of gestation, the fetus decreases uh, its responses to repeated or continuous stimulation. It habituates to it. If you walk into a smelly room, 10 minutes later, it smells less. The fetus is already doing it. Its sensory system is capable of habituation. This is what we call habituation. The newborn infants have been shown to recognize rhymes and stories presented before birth. If you want the details on this, we have a paper coming out in uh, neuroscience and biobehavioral reviews on precisely this particular point. Um, newborns also prefer smells, tastes, and sound patterns that are familiar because they've been presented to the fetus uh, in the prepartum environment. Um, we know also that the effect, this is our work as well, that fe effective fetal exposure to pseudo words um, on the neural responses to valve. In other words, does the fetus um, when, learning to when learning the distinction or when being reinforced for hearing vowel sounds as opposed to consonant sounds, is the fetus capable of differentiating uh, those sounds? The answer is yes. Is the neonate? Yes. And that's one of the aspects of the early acquisition of language skills and why it is that the critical period for phonemes, for example, is less than one year. So we're capable already of cognitive modifiability in the womb. And we'll see how this plays out in a, in, in, in a moment. So what we can say up to this point is that learning, which is the, is the foundation of adaptive and intelligent behavior, is based on the changes entirely in neural assemblies, a la head, head rather, uh, reflected by the modulation of electrochemical brain responses. And um, we're gonna see how this plays out um, I'm going to skip ahead for a moment. So the question is, what's going on with the newborn infant? So this baby, this neonate, is uh, 10 hours old. And daddy is sticking his tongue out. And what we're trying to do and see is if the, the neonate full term is capable of imitating the action. And yes, he is. Well, this didn't, he didn't learn how to do this in 10 hours. This is obviously a stimulus response relationship that was developed prior to birth. And so it also is the basis for interaction, and if we want to go to the psychological literature on this, is exactly what Piaget was talking about during sensory motor development. That is, we sense, we see, and we imitate. Big question is, what's going on with fetal sensation? Um, sensory structures are present relatively early. Sensation is not perception. Sensation is you feel pain, you feel uh, you hear, you see, 
but it doesn't mean that you necessarily do anything with it. In other words, you don't interpret it. That's what perception is. So we do know that visual experience is negligible. We do know that the fetus experiences tactile stimulation as a result of its own activity, so it can self-stimulate already. That's stimulus response. And it does learn how to do various things in, in the womb. And it tastes and smells the amniotic fluid because it will have differentially prefer amniotic fluid postpartum to all other kinds of smells. It's used to it. And it responds from, to sounds from at least the six months of, the state, of gestation. The first sense to develop um, is, um, is the response, well, sorry, the first uh, response that develops is movement to avoid uh, the touch of a hair on the cheek. And that happens at around eight weeks. But the sensitivity at around 10 weeks in the genital area, the palms of the hands at 11 weeks, um, the soles of the feet, abdomen and buttocks and the whole body, in other words, the sensory development piece is developed pretty much by the 32nd gestational week. So, the nose develops, odors become available in fluids, uh, bathing na the nasal cavity sometime between the 11th and the 15th week, and structures of taste are completed. Um, that is, the fetus swallows more sweet than any other kind of taste. Listening, there's reactive listening at the 16th week, and we can measure this stuff. The auditory structures are complete and intact by the 24th week. Mom's voice is differentially active, activates the fetus, fetal activity as compared to all other voices. And there's recognition and preference for maternal voice over any other kind of known material. Vision, uh, the fetus can avoid or attack needles from amniocentesis by about the 16th week. Twins locate each other very easily and they touch each other's faces as I've shown you in the uh, video before, or give each other's hands sometime around the 20th gestational week. There's light sensitivity at the, something around the 20th week, There's light, eyelids opening and finally visual focus and follow up vertical and horizontal by the 31st of the second, uh, 32nd gestational week. There is both a physiological and an emotional or cognitive aspect of pain perception. So the processing can be independent of perception, um, like surgeries under general anesthesia, but no deceptive stimuli can elicit subcortically mediated physiological stress responses despite unconsciousness. And by that I mean the nociceptive system, those are the receptors inside the skin itself, are already developed by the um, 24th gestational week. And there will be a, um, a physiological stress response to the administration of a needle. So the kinds of things you'll see will be an elevation of incre increased blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, fibrinogen level, blood clotting factor, um, and an increase in ACTH, adrenal corticotrophic hormone, which uh, is highly associated with the, in, with the stress response. In other words, they're stressed with the administration of a needle. So to emotionally experience pain, we have to be cognitively aware of the stimulus and we must be conscious. That's a different question. Uh, because the fetus is actively kept asleep, we'll call that unconscious, for a variety of endogenous inhibitory factors, including, including adenosine um, and prostaglandin D2, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the nociceptive pathways are intact from about mid-gestation onwards. And so the critical aspect of cortical awareness in the process of pain perception is missing at that particular point. So maybe they feel pain, maybe they don't but they certainly do re are reactive to it. And that's the difference between sensation and perception. Um, so let's move this ahead. And uh, reference tactile sensitivity. See it at around seven weeks. The specialized, specialized nerve endings for feeling pain. These are seen at around seven weeks, around the mouth and face and over the entire body by about 20 weeks. They're more densely configured per square inch than in the adult because the surface area of the fetus is significantly smaller than the adult. There's a punctiform distribution, as you know, on our backs, which is why it's kind of difficult for us to have somebody scratch our backs or direct them, but it's less difficult uh, for, to identify that for the fetus. And until the nerve fibers are mature and coated with myelin, the pain signals are carried by fibers that will later carry touch. 
And we know that neurons in the spinal cord, the dorsal horn neurons in particular, develop before 13 weeks. Uh, so instead of uh, going through our list, let's move this ahead. Um, so over time, we learn to modulate our pain response. The brain sends inhibitory signals to the body to lessen our reactions. And the reason it needs to do that is because pain out of all the senses is the least rapidly adapting. So smell adapts inside of a few minutes. Uh, hearing the same thing, something that's very loud becomes less loud, but pain tends not to. So there needs to be a system to kind of reduce chronic pain. Uh, and there are inhib inhibitory signals that are sent to lessen those reactions in the fetus. So the ability to modulate or inhibit pain doesn't develop until about the 36th to 40th week of gestational age. Therefore, pain in the fetus and premature infant is unmodulated or unfiltered until the baby is almost full term in gestation, but it is still prepartum. So let me just skip ahead. And let's get to the cortex. The cortex begins to develop to fo in form sometime between the eighth to the 10th week, if you remember. Uh, and so we had seen this earlier on in the video that we had seen. Um, and let me just simply skip ahead in the interest of time. So in studies, and our studies of living fetuses, we have demonstrated the ability to generate fight or flight hormones in response to painful stimuli as early as 16 weeks. Uh, we can, we've done this through catecholamines, beta endorphins, and cortisol. And as we said before, when a needle is placed through the liver to give a fetus a transfusion, these hormones are released. The abdominal wall has pain fibers, but there's a difference, as I said before, between sensation and perception. Um, so, <coughs> moving ahead. Um, see if we can skip through this quickly before we run out of time. So what we need to do is to look at how all of these functions integrate with each other. And so the integrate, because remember you said that what we're dealing with cognitive is functional connectivity. This is what we can measure in adults, for example, with a quantitative EEG, which is the amount of activity that's shared between any two electrode arrangements. So what we can see in integrated activity is erections and genital erections in ultrasound as a reaction to finger sucking. Um, we can also notice that during sexual, relation, sexual relations with the parents, the heart accelerates and decelerates in a reactive way, and there's an increased fetal movement associated with parental orgasm. REM sleep, about 23 weeks, which means REM is associated with dreaming. REM is also associated with learning. That is, the function of dreaming is not as Freud said. Well, it's also as Freud said, but its principal purpose is to consolidate memory traces, and we pick that up as symbolic forms. So the, the neonate and uh, infant, um, less than six months old, for that infant, because learning, because memory has a limited capacity, the infant sleeps 80% of a 24-hour cycle, newborn, and an older infant, up to about six months, about 50% of a 24-hour uh, cycle. And the reason for that is there's a high degree of redundancy built into the system already. But it's during, if you wake an adult up out of REM sleep, they'll tell you that they were dreaming. And they will tell you something in the main about visual imagery in all of that. So the fetus at around 23 weeks has REM sleep. It's learning. It's chunking information. That information can be recorded with evoked potentials and it is learning as well. And all sleep during pregnancy is REM, and in the end, 50% of sleep is about REM. So let me just skip through this, because uh, I don't want to get into philosophical debates, um, and simply indicate here that, um, moving ahead, uh, to the basic point of how learning actually occurs. If you remember the first slide that we put on, we, the second slide, we said that, a, um, that localization of function is a non-starter. So here we have an example of embodied language. And it could be any sensory or, 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 or any function of a human organism. But here is a language network associated with visual objects. 
And you can see it's not located to Broca's area or to Wernicke's area, but in fact covers the visual cortex as well. And here we have language networks associated with actions. And here you see it, the, the network involves uh, the premotor areas, the motor strip essentially, as well as Broca and Wernicke's areas. So it's not the temporal lobes. It's the connection, it's the functional connectivities between bits and parts of the system. And so here we have leg-related word network, an arm-related network, and a face-related word. This is in young children. Um, we can measure this stuff in the fetus, and we can measure this stuff in neonates, and we find that it's essentially the same thing other than one issue. Teenagers and adults have larger, what are called uh, large world networks, which means the whole brain tends to be involved, whereas in the case of the fetus and young child, it tends to be greater emphasis on local networks because you're building these connectivities. Um, so now we need to talk about physical activity and cognitive relationships in the context of what we've just spoken about. And what we can do is simply say, fetuses learn, that learning has something to do with movement and has something to do with stimulation. You don't move, things slow down. And one of the things that's happening, of course, in early childhood is we move less. Our children are very busy with their thumbs and video games, and they're getting obese and they move less. And um, what we know that happens as a consequence of movement exercise as well is that there's a substance called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is associated with neuroplasticity, which promotes neural size, dendritic branching, spine numbers, and this does so in the rodent hippocampus, and it does it in human beings as well. So when you move, you have more DNA, I'm sorry, more BDNF. With more BDNF, you have greater plasticity and greater connectivities in uh, different parts of the system. Question is, um, what happens um, after seven days of a, a mouse is uh, in, in a mouse's hippocampus after wheel running, you see significant changes in um, uh, as compared to sedentary mice um, in the amount of BDNF and as a consequence, the amount of neuroplasticity. The dentate gyrus volume remains consistent um, uh, with volunteer, but um, there are these fundamental changes. You can see here that where in obese individuals, the difference between controls and obese individuals uh, is significant. And we see the same thing with ADHD kids as well. Um, so this is not our work, this is Hillman's work from Champagne in uh, Urbana. If you sit quietly, your cortex is relatively inactive. If you walk after 20 minutes, uh, your brain becomes active. And there was a question that came up three sessions before mine which was how to deal with children in uh, Zambia, I think it was. Um, have them walk for 20 minutes and those aerobic changes will push the amount of glucose in the brain. They'll learn better, that's simple. And there's a huge amount of literature to support precisely that point. We can see also that um, something at, like walking is um, associated with gray matter volume increases in specific brain regions. And that's physical effects on brain. And that is why the fetus is moving because it's facilitating the amount, the capacity of the fetus to learn. And we see this in older children as well. Remember, our topic is interdisciplinary and therefore inter uh, applications areas as well in cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience. So here we can see the difference on academic skills between exercise and con control groups. Uh, where well, this is the exercise group, this is the control group, again, Hillman's work in reading, math, and spelling. Um, or executive control, spatial, and speed functions, the same issue here as well. And so what we can also say is complex movement uses more brain areas. And the movement, complex movements of the fetus is significant. Um, so, what we can say in summary is that markers of fetal pain perception start in the seventh week and mature over the next 12 weeks. By the 20th week, the anatomy of the nervous system of the fetus and, the physi and its physiology of responding to pain impulses draws a clear cause and effect relationship. Fetal responses are more than reflexes and infer perception or consciousness. And the word emphasized there is 
infer maternal anesthesia alone is not enough and that in this very quick overview of fetal learning and infant capacity i'd like to thank you for remaining conscious for our 45 minutes or so so thanks very much and throw it open for questions thank you so much uh, dr gary lisman it's uh, really very informative session and i request other uh, speakers and uh, attendees have any questions to dr gary you can ask now any questions to dr gary uh if you guys do have any questions uh, certainly during the course of the day you can take chats and uh, i guess that our emails will be available made available over uh, after the sessions are over so thank you very much for a great presentation <clears throat> and this is a great for foundation for the clinicians is me clinicians to work practically with the patients of different ages, ages, including the elderly people. Question about mm, heart development and brain development. Heart, heart starts beating before the brain starts developed. I'm sorry, Valentin, I didn't, I didn't hear your question. It was an uh, interference. The heart, heart start beating, heart muscles start yeah. beating before the brain develops. Any, yeah. any explanation about this? Of course. Um, if I were to take, um, well, let's see, there are uh, two types of tissue in the heart, essentially. One is nodal tissue, and the other, of course, is cardiac muscle. And yes, there's also Purkinje fibers and so on and so forth. The difference between heart muscle uh, cells and nodal cells is that the nodal cells are intrinsically conductive. So if I could take a heart out of somebody, and it's been done, especially with transplants, and leave the patient on a heart lung machine, the heart will still beat because the cells are conductive in the, in the nodes. But what they won't do is they won't beat in unison. And that's the basis for heart block. The reason that our hearts function, and no one here is having a thank God, is because we have a double pathway. One pathway is um, the, via the cardiac acceleratory nerves, uh, via the brainstem, and the other, the cardiac inhibitory nerves. So the function of the nervous system, and this is true for all aspects of cognition, physiological function, is we have a double system. If you turn on an electric light, for example, in the house with a switch, what you do is you get two pieces of metal that are separated from each other, and you turn the switch, and there's a piece of metal that now connects them, and now you complete the circuit. The nervous system doesn't work that way. The nervous system works on the basis of it's on all the time. You have a contracture all the time. So you need another system to turn it off like that. So that's the issue between excitation facilitatory pathways and inhibitory pathways. And that creates a rhythm. But that rhythm is intrinsic and it's, got not, it's not controlled centrally. So in answer to your question, the, uh, it, we need a brain to be able to say, okay, now I want you to have the beat, uh, your, your heartbeat of the falling. <gasps> oh my God, I'm shocked. And so immediately the brain tells the heart, start beating faster. In fact, it's a sympathetic response, which means the heart beats faster, the lungs uh, uh, respire more quickly, the stretch receptors are involved, ACTH is pumped, fibrinogen level, blood sugar level increases. But at the end of the day, it all comes from the brain. And so to answer to your question, a heart can beat and do its own thing, and it doesn't need a brain to do that. But it does need a brain to put uh, a trigger signal onto the heart so that everything works together. And if there's a problem with that system, welcome to the world of pacemakers. The question is about autogenesis, time-related events, heart start beating earlier before the brain developed. Ah. The brain developed on the electromagnetic and mechanical waves from the heart. So if your question, as I un if I understand it correctly, is relating to ontogenesis, why would the brain, I'm sorry, why would the, why would the heart develop 
before the brain develops? And the answer to that is, well, um, if you want to develop a computer system, better have the components of that computer system working properly before you deal with control. It's not the brain that develops the human body. It's the human body develops, and then the, you need some means of controlling what has already developed. It needs a central processor. So the last thing that's going to go into constructing a computer, not that a brain is a computer, it's not. Um, it, it, the, the last thing that you want is the CPU, because if nothing else works, the CPU is not going to work either. So the central processing unit is the thing that comes last. And so ontogenetically, your question is well taken, which is very well taken, which is, let's have the mechanics work first, because if the mechanics don't work first, then you're not going to have uh, appropriate blood flow and oxygenation to develop the computer up here. So that would answer that question. Thank you. Well, now the question is about ontogenesis in the sub Cortical nucleus, locus ceruleus, for example, the rough nuclear. What is the time frame for development of these structures? I don't know, but we're working on it. The reason I'm working on it has something to do with what you're up to. Um, we're really looking at on the tail end of the system on um, changes, uh, plastic, plastic changes in older adults. So we had done a study. Uh, it's got published, I can send it to you after this thing, of people who had zero musical training in their lives, and they were all adults. Some of the, uh, so we did it as a consequence of age. And what, they would do, what we did was we trained them how to play a piano, bimanually. And uh, inside of about two weeks, and this was not done with EEG, it was done with EEG and was done with fMRI. Inside of two weeks, there were changes, measurable changes in the locus ceruleus. It was a kind of strange place to kind of see this thing. But if they didn't practice for the next two weeks, it went away. But those who kept on practicing for about six months, that was a permanent change. And that told us that neuroplasticity is um, present, alive and well, in um, even people in the third, and third age, um, and even in the fourth age, that is, you're capable of learning at any point in life, just a function of time. It's going to take longer. So, yeah, the, the, the subcortical structures are very, very much part of this entire process. And we can see this very clearly. I mean, uh, if you take adult models, cognitive models, I, 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 this happens to me all the time. And I speak to a neurologist, my colleagues. Thank God I don't do neurology anymore. But... Um, I speak to my colleagues about a Parkinson's patient, and I tell them, what's the principal problem? Well, they give me the stuff about the basal ganglia, and, 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 and. what's the principal measurable clinical problem? I said, no, oh, difficulty in walking. And tremor, of course. And I said, no, walking is a spinal response. It's got nothing to do with the brain. Because I can throw a fetus, not a fetus, I can throw a, a, um, a, a neonate into a swimming pool, and the kid, the neonate's gonna start swimming away. So what the essential problem is, and this is the more focused answer to the question, is what's underneath gate freeze is the decision to move. And what you've essentially done is you've broken the functional connectivity between the movement, which is spinal, and the decision to them. Remember I said in passing that when we move, there's no brain. The brain doesn't respond, but when you plan the movement, there is. So the cognitive piece trumps everything else. We should pardon the expression. Um, I won't get into politics. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you know, the, so the issue here is, if you can connect the the decision to move with the movement, you've solved the problem. And I can do that very easily from a rehabilitation standpoint in the adult model with Parkinson's by having a patient hold a cane. And if the patient holds a cane and bangs it against his foot, he or she will have no problem walking because they're getting feedback that that feedback connects those two systems together. I can do it with brain computer interface, but it's much easier holding a cane. So the answer is back to the fetal model uh, again, which is the development of these functional connections between brain areas to automate responses. Thank you.
Hello. Yes. Uh, I'm Dr. Singh. Hello, Dr. Singh. Can you tell us, I enjoyed your talk very much, of course. Can you tell us about the role of uh, perinatal and periconception factor in the transmission of uh, uh, some of the characteristics from mother to the offspring? That's a rabbit hole um, that I uh, could probably go down, um, but I'll try some. I'll try. I'll try some of it. Okay. What I can tell you is that the fetus, I'm sorry, the neonate has a preference for mother's voice as opposed to everyone else's voice. The fetus, sorry, if the fetus hears something like Dr. Seuss. Uh, like the cat in the hat, and is read a number of different books after birth, postpartum, um, that the fetus will differentially react to Dr. Seuss as compared, the studies have been done, uh, we've done them as well. The fetus will, will differentially react to Dr. Seuss as compared to all other st stimulation. Same thing is also true with vowel sounds versus consonants. Uh, and I think same thing is same thing is also true with, with music. Um, and so if a child hears, I'm going to be careful with this one. If a child hears something like a Mozart, uh, like a divertimento or something like that, um, and heard it during um, uh, the mother's pregnancy, during fetal development, it will differentially respond to the Mozart. That is not to say that Mozart, you need to listen to Mozart during pregnancy. That, those studies were nonsense. Uh, in, in, they never got replicated. But the issue of, oh, I remember this, is there. And the reason it's there is because the capacity, the neural, neurological capacity for learning is already intact by the third trimester of pregnancy. And that's why imitation is possible. That's why um, uh, preferences are possible. That's why we see habituation. And so now in answer to your question, without really answering your question, because I don't want to do that, is uh, there are characteristics that the infant has that are similar to mommy's. And that's not necessarily a genetic thing. It's got something to do with the experiences that the fetus had during pregnancy. Are there genetic issues at play in here? Yeah, of course. I mean, the issue of activity level, for example, highly, we said highly active fetuses become highly active to do with um, the level of uh, various kinds of hormones that exist. I don't know. But there are too many um, confounding variables for me to answer that question definitively. But what I hopefully did in answering your question was give you a sense of um, the kinds of things that we do see postpartum that evidently developed uh, prepartum. So, sorry for the half answer. Yes. So, uh, Ram Singh, uh, please unmute and uh, if you have any further more questions, you can ask to Gary now. Ram Singh, can you hear us? Uh, I think he's unmuted. Hello? Yes, yeah. Uh, I heard a hello. Any more questions to Dr. Gary? Hello. Yep. Uh, yes, we can hear you. You can ask. It's okay. Hello. Uh, my talk is after half an hour, I think uh, 5.30. Uh, Sylvia just uh, uh, asked a is asking a question. No, it's all right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gary, uh, for your keynote talk, you know, all the speakers and oh. fellow speakers. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, sorry, yes. sorry. Uh, I was trying to ask a question, but then there was there were some background uh, questions as well. I just wanted to find out before, before you go, Doc, I wanted to find out about your opinion over um, late rehabilitation. I know that some people get 
developmental concerns or even disability later on in life. But what I have seen from your presentation is that uh, there's some kind of growth that really takes place quite early in life. You know, certain things really uh, develop rapidly and then it, as we grow, there's some uh, slowness somewhere. So I wanted to find out about uh, late rehabilitation because here in Zambia, for instance, parents do not uh, take their children for intervention very early because maybe diagnosis takes long. We find that by the time the child is seeing uh, a therapist, they are eight, nine, and by the time parents are accepting the child is 12 or even 14. What advice do you have for people that see these uh, clients that have neurological issues, but then you can actually see that this was really, really delayed and only bringing the child who is 12, 13. What can we do, you know, in such instances? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, give you a relatively uh, short answer and uh, a relatively long one. I'll start with a long one. Um, the Americans had an experience of this in the 1960s. There was a study, uh, it was called the Harvard Preschool Project. And it was done by, uh, performed, <clears throat> the lead investigator was a gentleman named Burton White. Probably not a bad idea to revisit that literature. And what he did that was different from everything else that had been done up to that point was instead of bringing uh, children into a lab, he went to visit the children at home uh, and one week went by and mom came to the door every day with her hair done and makeup and all of this at six o'clock in the morning. About a week later, she came, she was all disheveled. So he knew that he had already established rapport and could see what was going on in the, in, in the, um, uh, in the family unit. And he discovered that, well, cutting to the chase, what he had actually done was that work was the basis of what ultimately became Head Start. So Head Start was a program uh, of kind of compensatory education for children from priority neighborhoods where the children would be given um, skills to learn to get them up to cognitive status to rehabilitate them essentially prior to the time that they turned up at school. It largely didn't work. The reason it didn't work as well as it should, I should say, it worked, but not as well as it should, is because they started too late. Um, they really needed to do this from age zip to instead of age two. So when they, and of course, uh, the US government uh, funded this thing, but they funded it without um, actually having data to support that funding because that would be like apple pie. Why would you not fund mothers and fund mothers and children? Of course you do that. So later it was determined that you needed to start at a much earlier age. I'm saying you need to start during fetal development. What happened when they started earlier is that there were significant gains cognitively. Um, and the reason for that now gets us back to um, neural development and the um, neuroanatomy and the physiology of all of this. We spoke about functional connectivities. So the purpose of um, education, in ge generally speaking, is to develop connectivities where beforehand no connections existed. In order to do that, there's only one way to do that. And as much as educators and special educators don't want to hear this word, the only way to do that is by repetition and drill again and again and again and again and again and again and again. That having been said, there's another problem with this system, and that is the issue of critical period. So there are optimum times for learning something. And if you're beyond the optimum time, uh, you, it's not that it won't happen. It's that it's going to be significantly harder to happen and it may actually be non-existent. So come into the uh, world of gazelle and uh, from the 1940s um, about feral children, kids who were, uh, who were abused, locked up in rooms for 12 years. Well, they never developed language. Um, uh, they may have had uh, Itar from 1790 something or other, 1794 I think it was, um, where he had found the so-called wild boy of Aviron. He uh, found that this kid had, was capable of, of vocabulary, pretty much like a chimpanzee, of about 150 words. 
The issue, uh, if we take normal children, for example, let's say those born with congenital, ca congenital cataract, and it used to be the practice to operate, to do uh, lens aspiration, hmm, probably sometime by about first or second grade. Well, kids have already learned form discrimination haptically by touch. So if you ask a kid in second grade who just recovered his eyesight, having been blind since birth, um, whether he could determine the difference between a triangle square or a circle, the answer would be, yeah, of course, but not visually. He saw, but he couldn't do the cognitive piece of that. He would have to do it haptically with his finger. He'd have to touch the... So without getting into this, because in, I could spend hours on this thing, um, the answer to your question is the earlier, the better. Because of the issue of neuroplasticity, because of the circuits of being formed, because if you notice people who are kids who are bilingual, language is impaired in all cases, they're slower in all cases, as compared to those who, um, require, um, uh, who are unilingual, and eventually they catch up. But you can't get to be bilingual, appropriately bilingual, after a certain age. You turn up from one country and move to another that doesn't have your native language at the age of 15 or 16, your whole brain tends to be active as compared to the temporal lobes, uh, which are highly associated with specific language um, uh, skills, such as um, either expression in the case of, of uh, anterior to the Sylvian fissure, in Broca's case, or Wernicke's uh, in, the, in terms of understanding. So my answer to your question is, the earlier, the better, critical period is critical, it doesn't mean that learning is not possible. It just means you're going to get to that, you're going to get into that window when it is the most opportune time to do that. And if you want more detail on the subject, and I'm really not pushing it, you don't need to buy it, just find it somewhere. Read the book that I did with uh, Melillo on neurobehavioral disorders of childhood. Uh, but my name's on there too. So um, take a look at that also, and you'll get a real clear sense of why it's important to start as early as you possibly can. Talk those parents into starting at zip. Okay, thank you so much. Just, uh, just a reminder of the, of the study you mentioned and the title, maybe you could just type it in the, in the chat. Uh, I, can, I can get you the, I can put it into the chat. Uh, the gentleman, I can't, don't remember the, the title of the study, um, but it okay. does relate to the history of the, it is the, Harvard, the history of the Harvard Preschool Project, and the senior investigator was Burton White. Okay. But I will, okay. Uh, I'll send it to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions to Gary? why you speak sharply? So Ram Singh, no. you have, you have no, any questions? All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gary. Uh, it's really a you know, great session. So with that, uh, now we are moving on to the next session by uh, Dr. Ram Singh uh, from the Teotom Institute. Yeah, from, yeah, and he's going to speak on uh, e -babe can, uh, happiness prevent dementia. So <coughs> Ram Singh, you can take the screen and you can uh, go ahead with your session now. Okay. Hello. Yeah, hi, Ram Singh. We can hear you. Uh, well, good, good evening, evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very much delighted to be here and I wish to share some of my views on happiness in the prevention of dementia. The word happiness. So, request uh, Ram Singh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. Can you please share your screen? Share. Yes. Yeah, to present your uh, PPT so that uh, the others can uh, see your uh, uh, PPT. Yeah, you need to share your screen and uh, slides so that the slides. Slide so much slides I have sent sent to you. So slides are there with us, you mean to say, right? Yeah, please. I, I'm not very much aware of the technology, so I have sent the slides to you. Uh, just give us a couple of minutes. We will uh, yeah. share share it. Yeah, just yeah. just a couple of minutes, please. Yeah, Thank it's you. Okay. In the meantime, yes, you can. I would like to 
uh, introduced to you the ancient Indian knowledge from the scriptures. You know, India had a history of uh, about 7,000 years old, and it starts from Veda and Upanishads. And you know, these scriptures are supposed to be uh, from 5000 BC. Uh, from that, that, that very time, we know the relation of body and mind, and also brain body connection. And uh, there is an ancient scripture called Bhagavad Gita in which uh, Lord Krishna tells to Arjun, the fighter or warrior who was nervous, and speaks about, uh, about mind, body connection. And it's in Sanskrit, actually. And I would just uh, recite it, Chanchalam hi mana Krishna Ramati Balbad Braham this means that the mind is very tenacious, turbulent, but quite strong. However, it could be curbed by practice of meditation and feeling of decision. So the role of meditation in controlling the mind or the, some of the neural mechanisms was known to ancient Indians. Uh, can you see the slides now? Just one moment. I'm sharing your slides. Yes. So this is the picture that shows this, and this is in Sanskrit, and uh, this is in English. Another one says that food which are bitter, acid, pungent, burn, and fried, give rise to pain, mental stress, and disease. That means relation of diet and brain was also known to ancient Indians. Next, Next slide, please. Buddha <coughs> is again from the, I think, BC, and he proposed the tenfold, eightfold path. And then from this, perhaps meditation and mindfulness are, are already explored by the Western world, and it has been found that mindfulness can be useful in the prevention of varying mental diseases and mental dysfunctions. And these eight chakra that are shown here, they represent the they represent the eight behaviors of men. Now this has become important. But uh, I, am, I have become interested after reading this experiment teacher. And this experiment uh, is activating positive memory. In RAM suppresses detritional like behavior in the mouse. And this was published uh, in 2015. But uh, uh, this is very important. And there, there was another, another article, activating happy, happy memories, memories cheers movie bombs in the nature, nature itself. So, so these two experiments indicate that happiness developed from certain part of the brain, and, and this, this could be manipulated, and, and it could be useful uh, for promotion of uh, some of the cages. And there are several, uh, some publications by our group, in, in which we try to study happiness, and, and also describe the role of happiness in the promotion of diseases. Next, Next slide, please. Next, Next one. one. 
So, so happiness, happiness and health. health. Can, can happiness, happiness provide, provide uh, good health? health. And, and this is the experiment, experiment uh, this is the brain of the uh, mouse. mouse. And uh, this uh, shows uh, that uh, uh, certain area which are shown, which are shown, which, which are shown in the uh, blue, blue color, color. Or, uh, and also in the bright color, they are important uh, in, in the happiness, in causing, in producing happiness. Next one, please. Next, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. This experimental study showed acute rescue stress induced depression related behaviors in mice by optogenetically reactivating dentate virus cells that were previously active during cognitive experience. A brain wide investigation identified glutaminergic activity in the hippocampus amygdala nucleus equivalence pathway as a candidate circuit supporting the acute rescue. This I am reading for you because these two are hippocampus amygdala and nucleus. They could be important if they are modulated during aggression, depression, or anger. Uh, this might be they, uh, because they are also responsible for these uh, behavioral uh, dysfunction. The hippocampal cells that were chronically reactivated were associated with positive memory rescue of stress-induced behavior impairment. And therefore, it is possible that activating positive memory artificial sufficient to suppress depression-like behaviors and also possibly aggression because amygdala is responsible for all these behavioral factors. Next, please. Next one. The happiness gene has also been discovered in the London School of Health in 2011 and 5-hydroxytryptamine gene. It carries the code of serotonin receptors. Serotonin is a feel-good neurotransmitter and uh, it requires on cell walls for them attached to order to exert their effects. Next slide, please. Next one. Now, the World Happiness Index has been proposed by the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, but it is not perfect or it's not very scientific. And the indicators of happiness are gross domestic product, social support, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity of helping others, corruption level, administration in the country. But all these factors uh, may not be necessary for happiness. It may depend on other factors. Next, one. next slide, please. This is the happiness index of 2018. And according to this index, Finland, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Netherlands, they are the first five who are, who are supposed